that what we really need to do is see more whistleblowers, encourage more whistleblowers to come forward if we're going to fight corruption. And that means that we have to stack the cards in their favor. We have to entice whistleblowers. series of conversations to distill wisdom within the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I've invited a bunch of people who are extraordinary examples of those very qualities who have some really extremely important experiences to share on how South African society can heal, not from the contagion and the virus of COVID-19, but the contagion of corruption. There are people who have trodden the wine press alone, who have tried hard to be really useful, resigning the things that people count for happiness, seeking good deeds that lead to obscurity, accepting with equal face those that bring ignominy, the applause of all or the love of none. People who have made perfect their will and who have taken no thought of the harvest, but only of proper sowing. Now, those of you who are T.S. Eliot fans will recognize those lines as a paraphrase from a passage of, from one of his works, the pageant play Choruses from the Rock. And it's become for me the guiding North Star of my social work career. And I've been on the hunt for people that exemplify those qualities, and I've found them. A whole bunch of them. And it's been hugely humanizing to me to have the privilege of, of meeting them. They're called whistleblowers. And the star of this show is Mandy Wiener, whose latest book titled The Whistleblowers collects the stories of these truly remarkable people. I've been so looking forward to the book because in August last year, Mandy contacted Wayne Duvernay, the CEO of Arta, who then put it on to me, to see if an anonymous whistleblower known, known as James Tiberius was willing to share his story, and she tells the story in chapter five. Captain Kirk and the starship Etol. Now, obviously, those of you who are Star Trek fans like me would know that that James Tiberius is, in fact, the commander of Starship Enterprise. So Wayne and I just nicknamed him Captain Kirk, uh, and he remains anonymous to this day. And, and really, as I got to know him, Really, he did exemplify the qualities that T.S. Eliot wrote about, about doing good deeds in service of truth without thinking about what harvest was in it for him. One of those people who sought to do proper sowing. Uh, so I got hold of him and he said yes. He was happy to share his story without disclosing his identity. So having helped Mandy with that chapter and being very impressed with her skill at distilling a complex story into a gripping drama, I couldn't wait to read all the others. So having done so, and this book now having come out, it's blown such wind into my sails as a social worker because I realized that over a number of years, whistleblowers have confided in me professionally to expose injustices, more particularly on the wild coast, associated with the Kolobeni mining scheme and sand rolls into wild coast toll road. So I'm really hoping that Mandy's book will be the start of a whole new genre of non-fiction writing that helps develop a culture that supports whistleblowers, which is really the purpose of this particular instalment. But in putting this together, I thought it wouldn't be a good idea for me to anchor the conversation for two reasons. Well, firstly, because as someone who features in the book, which I want to share some of my own subjective re reflections, and it wouldn't be fair for me to try and do that while it's also being the anchor. Well, secondly, because I'm so impressed with the book that I would rather be Mandy's Mbongi, her praise singer, because she's done such a fine job that I was nervous that I might be too starstruck that I would make a hash of 
facilitating it. So I've asked another friend of mine, Joanne Joseph, who was in fact a colleague of Mandy for a while at 702, and is a much steadier hand in interviewing and facilitating discussions for public consumption. So thank you, Joanne, for helping me out with your very steady hands and tender heart and tough mind, of course. Over to you. John, thank you so much for that. And thank you for that kind introduction as well, and the opportunity to facilitate this discussion. Hi, everybody. Uh, so this is the book that, uh, that the discussion centers on, The Whistleblowers by Mandy Wiener. Just take a look at that cover. So it's the first one that you make a beeline for when you walk into the bookshop. It's very, very eye-catching indeed. Congratulations, Mandy. We know you to be a well-renowned journalist and author, and we know that you, you really take a lot of trouble with your painstaking research into the, uh, the subjects of this nature, whatever you're covering, really, in the host of books that you have already brought out. So this time, I think uh, uh, Mandy has really curated a series of experiences that are, are both quite perturbing and happening at the same time you know they, uh, they then these narratives are set against the backdrop of what has become widespread corruption in South Africa John having referred to that earlier the motive isn't always money uh, as we'll see in some cases also, also often power as we'll particularly see in, in the case of Tabiso Zulu uh, but but Mandy's also balanced these stories with a marriage of fact and humanity and, and it makes it a far easier read than subject matter of this kind could be had it been handled otherwise so so it's quite a large panel. Let me just introduce you to the guests first of all. Uh, the author, Mandy, you've seen. Uh, Mandy is, uh, is going to be our, our first uh, interview. And uh, just next to her is Felix Dlangamandla. Uh, and, and after I've spoken to them, uh, I'm going to home in on three individual experiences from the book, which are pretty different in nature. Tabiso Zulu, whom I've mentioned, has been caught up in political violence in KwaZulu Natal. He's going to share his experience with us. Catherine Hunter is the sister of uh, Rosemary Hunter, who was caught up in an FSB scandal uh, around pensions. She's going to have a word with us on behalf of her sister. And John Clark, of course, whose platform this is and who's introduced me, is going to fill us in on his own experience, as he said, with Captain Kirk in uh, bringing forward this, this uh, whistleblower who was involved with the, uh, the goings on in the uh, the Etoll saga. So we'll get also get the perspective of an attorney who is specializing in human rights law, Colette Ashton there. She's going to talk us through some of the legal frameworks around uh, whistleblowing. And for the remainder of the discussion, we'll just throw out a, a few questions to the panel to hear their ideas on the kind of considerations that need to be discussed around whistleblowing in the future. So Mandy, I'm going to kick it off with you at this point. Why a book on whistleblowers at this time in our country's history? Thanks, Joan, and thank you so much for facilitating this conversation and to John for the platform as well. So I, I've spent a lot of time reporting on um, the day-to-day -day news stories in the country, which we, we know about. Everyone knows these stories about the Zondo Commission and state capture and ETOLs and the arms deal. But I was really intrigued by, as you say, the humanity, the human narrative behind these stories. And um, I just finished a, a book uh, called Ministry of Crime, which was really looking at the underworld in South Africa and the criminal justice system and the capture of the, the police, crime intelligence, the hawks. And I thought, well, I want to take a step away from organized crime and, and gangsters and the underworld. And I met with one whistleblower who wanted me to do a book, and we had several meetings actually, but that book never happened. But I was so moved by the story of this whistleblower and the personal cost and the contribution that I thought, well, let me look at the other whistleblowers that have come forward at the State Capture Commission, but just generally that are, are making such a big difference in the fight against corruption. And I started, I interviewed one and then another and then another, and I thought, well, there's really something here. We don't pay enough attention to these people, I want to cast a spotlight on these individuals and the contribution that they make. And, and that's how it happened. It, it seems to me, because all these whistleblowers come from such different worlds, Mandy, that, that in order to find that thread between, uh, you know, what, what connects all of these different worlds, even though the backdrop is, is much the same, uh, that, that you probably had to apply your mind quite well to, to exactly how you were going to create a narrative linking all these lives. 
Well, that's right. And, and, and firstly, I think it's important to, to make the point that this is not an exhaustive list of whistleblowers in South Africa. These aren't the best whistleblowers or the ones that made the biggest contribution. These are just the ones whose stories I thought were interesting. There were many others that, that could have featured as well. Um, so, you know, there's no clear criteria for how I decided on these whistleblowers. It was just a cross section. Um, and then I, I must say that there were some similarities between many of them. There were threads that, um, that ran between many of these stories, although you wouldn't think so. And I spent a lot of time thinking about what is the defining character of a whistleblower? What is it that makes one person decide to speak out when so many people hold the same information? Is it a religious belief? Is it a strong sense of moral courage? Is it justice? Uh, in some instances, it was a strong single mother. Um, or it, it may have been a nurture rather than their nature. And I still can't say conclusively what it is. Um, I do think that it's a combination of all of those things. Mandy, on that note, I mean, at the, at, at the beginning of your, your book, you've got a, a sort of foreword by the former Trillion financial advisory CEO, Mosilo Modepu, uh, who, who refers to exactly what you spoke about, these whistleblowers being shadowy, faceless, voiceless people, but ultimately goes on to say they're heroes not whistleblowers. Is that the final impression they've left you with? Very much so. And Musina Motepu, who is not featured in, in this book because she's actually writing her own book about her experience as, as a whistleblower. And that is such a poignant quote because it very much speaks to the personal cost of whistleblowers. And she says there that she, she hates the label of whistleblower because she is so much more than that. She is a mother, she's a sister, she's a human being. She you know, doesn't like that phrase because what often happens is as journalists, we use them as sources and we land up getting awards, NGOs get funding and whistleblowers get forgotten. And that is very much the experience that, that I've had of whistleblowers is that they are pushed to the fringes of society. They are treated like in pimpies or pariahs as troublemakers. Um, they're seen as very, very problematic characters, they're unemployed, they're unemployable, they wear the scarlet letter W, and that, that just shouldn't be the case, unfortunately, but that's the reality. So let me just pick up on that idea. I mean, how open in general were the subjects of your book and talking to you about their experiences, given what they've been through and, and how they've been stigmatized as a result of speaking out? In some instances, they were very open and willing because they have almost made it a profession, that they've managed to leverage the situation to become professional whistleblowers um, or activists. Um, but in some cases, it took a lot of convincing where people just didn't want to talk to me for, for months, if not years. And it was an exercise in patience because they were so broken, they'd been so damaged by their experience that they didn't want to speak to another journalist. They'd gone through the mill, they'd realized that, that media chews them up and spits them out. Um, but for me, it was very much about sitting down and listening to that personal narrative um, and I've actually built very strong relationships with many of them because it is a huge responsibility to relay that story to do it justice um, and to carry that burden of what people go through. Mandy thank you so much for the effort you've put into this book because I think that that approach and, and your framing it for us so well gives us a good sense of, of exactly how you've gone into the project and thank you for that we'll continue our conversation with you in just a short while. Felix I'm going to bring you in here as the photographer who captured all of these experiences from a visual point of view and, and, and you've done the same with, with other massive stories uh, including Maricana, Madiba's passing, uh, several protests in the country. I imagine that subject matter would have differed greatly from depicting the people we refer to as whistleblowers and who you photographed for this book. What was distinctive for you about this project, Felix? Thanks, Joanne, and thanks for everyone for having me. Um, look, when Mandy approached me about this book and uh, I, I got shivers down our spine that we should be doing a book about whistleblowers, I got scared that uh, people will be following me around and now I'm putting my life at risk and all of that. But she explained it into details that, look, yours is to take pictures. I've done the interviews. We went into one of the um, whistleblowers in Pretoria. I walked into a house, mainly set up my cameras. You could see in their faces that these people, I mean, look, for an example, that the first whistleblower I went with Mandy to, she, she explained everything. And when I put up the cameras and started setting up, their eyes tell you that yes, I'm I'm a whistleblower, but it looks like they had they they're scared at the mo at, at some point. There's that that there's that element of being scared still at the moment that they they exposed this, but they don't know what's 
going to come for tomorrow. So for me, it was to put them at ease and then document their facial expressions, portraits of them that look, this is what we've done. We've exposed this corruption in, in, in certain companies. Now we're standing firm. Let me take portraits of you and tell the world about the wonderful job that you guys have done. But you've kept it, captured a beautiful ambiguity as well here, Felix. I mean, on the one hand, uh, when you look at the subjects and you study the picture, they're, they're often depicted as very strong and defined, especially the way they stare directly into the camera lens. On, on the other hand, there's this underlying sense of vulnerability there too. Tell me how you captured that contradiction. It was difficult to capture that uh, vulnerability, Joanne, because, um, like for an example, we went to Frieda with Mandy. We met uh, one of the... Uh, kids of the whistleblower she was crying literally crying and he, for you to be able to comfort her and say look mine is just to take pictures and he, the next thing you you feel like you also want to cry but you must be strong but you can see the vulnerability on them that they they they, they scared still but mine was just to put them at ease uh, manage to 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 smile with them and crack a little bit of jokes with them but the bottom line here, you could see and sense in their eyes that they, 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 need, they needed to be heard and we were there to do that. that that's a very interesting choice that you make uh, because uh, on the one hand, I mean, there's probably quite a lot of meaning that one could lay into a photo where, where someone has broken down in the course of this conversation with Mandy. Um, and, and yet, I don't see any pictures of, of crying women in this book, although we can well imagine the, the kind of anguish all of the whistleblowers featured in the book have gone through. Why, why the choice not to depict those moments? Yes, um, you don't see those pictures because um, I didn't want to portray that they were crying. They, they, were, they were strong and he, we, we, we had to, I had to compose myself as well. So mine was just not to show their vulnerability. I think a lot of them have gone over that chapter is not necessarily closed, but the few that cried, I mean, I think it was one only, and I, I actually had to compose myself. It, it, was, it, it wasn't for me to, 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 to take pictures of crying people. It was mine to, to portray what they, they, they are doing currently, how they're feeling about what their parents has exposed in, and what their parents wanted the country to be and the, to, to sort of get rid of the corruption that the country was engulfed in. So basically mine was just to show strong women, strong men that stood up against corruption. Just a, a final thought here, Felix. You've quoted Jean-Luc Godard as saying, photography is truth. What truths came alive to you in photographing these whistleblowers? Joanne, if you can see their eyes staring at you through that lens, you, you sort of get, you, you get goosebumps that these people stood against giant companies, big companies, and then they stood for the truth. I mean, they could have walked away and no one would have known about this, but they stood firm. And then those pictures to me, and if you look through their eyes, you can see that these guys are giants and they stood firm and we needed to correct the wrongs that were happening in, 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 in the past by showing these portraits of these guys who stood against these big companies. Felix, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. It really has been so interesting to hear from you as, as a fellow creative in this book. Thank you, Felix. I want to bring in uh, someone who is featured in, in, in a chapter that, that is really close to my heart, being from Bozina Natal. Uh, and, and it was deeply effective to me because uh, we had covered the story of Cindy Sumagata and his assassination or, or, what, or, or his, the attempt on his life that later resulted in his death. And the man now living at the center of that reality is, of course, Tabiso Zulu. And Tabiso, uh, Tabiso, thank you so much for agreeing to speak to us today. Your experience is, of course, captured in, in Chapter 13, A Badge of Honor, which situates you in KZN, where you've seen a, a host of political assassinations. Uh, and we know that such an attempt was also made on your life, and since then you've been in hiding. For those of our viewers unfamiliar with the nature of these events, can you please just very briefly explain the context of them in the Harigwala district. No, thanks a lot, Joanna, and um, um, good day to, to other panelists and to everyone else. Look, I've um, come to a situation where I never invited this to myself, but I'm now living through it. 
um, I think we are aware um, that uh, in 2016, I think it was at the end of September, uh, the late uh, Comrade Sinde Somakata gave me documents uh, that related to Umzum Kulu Memorial Hall, um, which uh, later I sent those documents to former general of the Hawks, uh, General Ntlemez. I sent them to SARS, Tom Moyane, uh, Commissioner Tom Moyane, and many other people, SIU um, um, advocate Jan Motibi, and many others. And uh, subsequent to that, uh, political killings started to happen in our province, but they happened after I've alerted the leadership of the ANC at the provincial level to say that I feared that um, uh, people are going to be killed and the source of the killings is corruption that is rife. I even, I remember that I even tempted a term where I said, arrest corrupt money if you want to stop the political killings that are about to happen. Then in July of next year, after the former speaker of Umzimkulu, Kaya Tobela, had been killed, after um, the, another council of Tutuzi Chibas have been killed, I remember that before my late friend was shot in July, I wrote a letter to the Hawks at national level and I said, listen, there are things that I think I need to share with you. And I remember that they sent Brigadier um, uh, Nyamego Klaba to come and interview me and there were subsequent meetings with other people after that. But what is more important in this is that uh, the unfortunate thing happened and what, what I feared most is that uh, they shot uh, Cindy so in, in July, and uh, he stayed in hospital, as we are aware, and uh, he later succumbed to his injuries, his injuries in September. Uh, for many people, they feel that uh, that is when they started to know about me and the work that I'm doing. It was after I'd spoken at the memorial uh, the service and uh, my, my other friend, Les Tuta, spoke at the funeral. Um, then people started to know about what was happening. And they thought, uh, many people think that that's what made some of us. Comrade Sindhi so died in, in 2017. I had started doing this in 2010. And uh, I've got quite more other stories that I can tell besides what has happened to him and what later happened to me and what I'm going through now. I mean, uh, much as, as he suffered, you've also had an attempt on your life. Um, I, have you ever received proper state protection in the wake of that? No, I haven't received any state protection. There are no arrests in those who attempted to take my life, despite the fact that we're having recordings uh, that narrates how the plot was um, shaped, despite the fact that uh, we've assisted in, in, in locating witnesses when the police, with all the money, all the gadgets, all the informers that they have, they couldn't locate uh, those witnesses on their own, despite that they knew the names, they knew the places of work and everything. Even today, we're still waiting. We were told that a uh, decision on, on whether to prosecute or not, in my case, was going to be made in August. It hasn't happened. Uh, we were told that it's going to be made in September. It hasn't happened. It's now November. Yesterday, I ended up writing a letter to to the head of uh, NPA advocate, Shamila Patoy, to say, I'm really starting to doubt if uh, in my matter there will ever be a decision to prosecute those who wanted to kill me. Tell me, so this has essentially turned your life upside down. You've been in hiding. You, you can't stay in any one place for, for any length of time. Uh, you've got a, a, a group of very close associates who you must trust, even with the meals that you consume. J just give me a sense of what your daily life is like since you decided to come out and be a whistleblower. Look, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy in a sense that uh, uh, at some stage I had um, close uh, protectors that were arranged, uh, uh, bodyguards, private uh, bodyguards that were arranged by friends and um, the family. At a later stage, we ran out of money. At a later stage, some of my friends were coerced. Uh, to, they, they were told that if they continue to assist me, uh, they are going to be in trouble and some of them had to retreat because they were also a uh, feeling that uh, their own lives were affected by what was happening but uh, some of the closest of friends remained and uh, they are remaining now and at the later stage i was protected by friends at a later stage i went to witness protection it has not been a life that you wish for a uh, worst of your enemies uh, because you need to always be on guard uh, and it really affects you it even affects you how you interact 
with those closest to you. Anything to you, you you watch how people talk, what they do on their phones and everything. You need to change phones even yourself. You need to at times uh, travel, leave your phone because you know that this thing that everyone is talking about now, this thing of, ping, of, of, of uh, being told that phones are being pinged. Uh, we've been telling about this thing. I remember that uh, even before Sindiso was shot and killed in, in July 2017, I remember that in 2008, we went to see the former provincial secretary of the ANC, uh, Senzo Mkuno, at the time, to tell him that uh, uh, there is a, a grab by Tom Zimkuru. We even knew it was at a certain shop, which is called Maxis. We even we told them that there is a grab. Politicians are using that grab to intercept SMSs, uh, all kinds of communications, calls, and other things. And um, crime intelligence in the province failed to peek and locate that grabber because uh, they, they, they didn't want to do it the way we were telling them that they can't take us to go and uh, point a grabber while we are traveling in untinted cars because people are going to recognize us and they are going to kill us at a later stage. So wh when people are, are starting to be killed in Cape Town and elsewhere because people are monitoring phones, these are some of the things that some of us have been saying since 2008 that people are intercepting other people's communications for solely purpose of killing people. It's a very, very disturbing story indeed. Thank you very much, Tabiso, for sharing your story. And, and of course, you'll stay with us for our broader discussion a little bit later on. I, I think uh, Tabiso's example there of how radically his life has changed also reminds us of something that, uh, that Rosemary Hunter went through, um, her family life severely disrupted by her choice to be a whistleblower as well. And, and we're joined by her sister, Catherine Hunter. And, and Catherine, your, your sister Rosemary's context was quite different Tabi uh, you've all got a history as an activist family, but Rose comes from a particular area of law, specializing in pension funds, as I understand it. And after her extensive experience at law firms, I understand she was asked to apply for the position of the Deputy Executive Officer of Retirement Funds and Deputy Registrar of Pension Funds at the Financial Services Board around about 2012. We understand she applied, she got that position, but she found some irregularities when she got there. Can you just briefly explain to us what your sister was up against, Catherine? Okay, thanks, Joanne, and thanks to, to everybody and to Mandy for putting it out there, um, putting the story out there, because it, it's just a tricky story. It's quite difficult because it's a matter of tracing the sort of minutiae connections within the law and within finance. Um, and if somebody doesn't work in that world, as I don't, um, it's not so easy to, to see what the flow diagram is of what was going wrong. So Rosemary arrived um, at the FSB in 2013. She had already had a very successful career in pension law and she's an absolute uh, stickler for for sort of minutiae and the law. She's really sort of devoted to, to detail. Um, and she arrived there to be in charge of pensions funds only to find that in fact there was a process that was already in place coming to the end of, of um, its run whereby the pension funds within the Financial Services Board being signed off by the Financial Services Board that um, belonging to many tens of thousands of pensioners where the, the, supposedly the pensioners could not be found and the money was therefore being um, signed away from them. So they no longer had the legal authority or the legal ownership of the pension money. Most of it, of course, um, people who are the most vulnerable in society who cannot uh, who cannot just go and knock on Dube Tidi's door, which is what he said people should do if they couldn't find their pensions. People from the whole subcontinent, many of them wives of people who had been paying into pension funds for decades, literally decades. And during the 90s, there were all sorts of changes, small businesses popping up and dying and so on. And people had been putting pension funds in, not realizing that, in fact, they are still due to receive their pensions back, even if the company um, collapses or if they are fired or if so on and so on, they are still entitled to that pension fund. And of course, there's an enormous, there are billions, literally billions of rands of pensioners' um, money sitting in various places, supposedly, and in the corporate sector, largely liberty life, um, but supposedly being kept in safe hands 
to get back to the rightful owners of that money. And what was happening when Rosemary arrived at the Financial Services Board was that she found that people, because it, was, it took effort, it took um, work, hard work on the part of Liberty Life and other financial institutions to go out and find people. In fact, they weren't bothered to go and find the people. They were just signing them closed. And Dubé Tidi, who is the, um, the CEO of the Financial Services Board, was just signing off. Um, as if he had looked at the paper trail. He was supposed to see that the proper research had happened um, and indeed these people were unfindable and then signed them closed and then the money would go into wherever it would go. The financial services were supposed to sort of safeguard this money on the part of, of, the, um, of the owners. That was not happening. 6,000 pension funds of various collections of types of pension funds were being frankly signed away from the rightful owners and admin fees were being deducted as well illegally certainly nobody was looking for the pensioners and of course the pensioners are very easy to find lots of them are um, registered at sasa they've got vodacom accounts they've got mtn accounts lots of big corporates who are trying to find previous pensioners can find them there are ways and means of finding them and it was absolute nonsense that they could not be found it was just too much bother and in fact liberty life and others weren't even bothering to gather the the paper trail to do the research um, we've got these vulnerable people out there who are not unionized. Many of them don't even know that this money is due to them. Money that were they to have, I mean, we all know that pensions money does not step, stop with a pensioner. It's there to, to provide for the, the family far broader than that one person. Rosemary smelt a rat quite early on. Innocently, she uses the word naively, yes assumed that if she started saying to people, oi, we've, we've got a problem here, what's going on? That the people in authority would say, whoops, I'm so glad you brought that to our attention. Please let's you know, put a process in place where in fact um, the right is done, the right thing is done. But that is not what happened. Rosemary started approaching people around for clarity, what's going on here, and then um, going into people, talking to people more and more senior, only to find that they, scoffed at her, laughed at her, and then, of course, started to turn on her. The, the worry is that she, she didn't really have any joy in reaching out to anyone, did she, in, in asking for help to write what was clearly a wrong? Absolutely. I mean, there was nobody on the inside that was senior enough who had influence, who had impact, who could actually hear her out. And she went further and further up. So there was no particular point where she thought, okay, I'm a whistleblower. And the reason I say that's relevant is because I think that's the case with many people who become whistleblowers. They are basically um, sort of expecting support and do what they believe is the right thing. And if everybody was doing the right thing, there would be no such thing as a whistleblower. We assume that the systems are working. We assume that people in authority are listening. Um, and in fact, a lot of people in authority are very threatened. They've got other things on their minds. They're distracted. And so was the case in Rosemary, for Rosemary. But also that I think there was a lot to, to cover up because these processes had been in place and been breaking laws at so many different levels, let alone national laws, internal process laws and so on has been happening for so long. And people were so comfortable people just turned on her she was in the board on the board again you would think for goodness sake that the chair of the board would hear you out they just again had counter counted everything she said but not counted it with facts and figures about the processes they counted it by turning dirty and ugly and sexist and goodness knows what i mean they were just trying to undermine her character they had no substance or in terms of her evidence to be able to say to her, no, you're wrong. They just said, you're wrong because you are whatever and smeared her reputation or tried to. It was just dirty, smutty way of dealing with people. And lots of people are up against that. I have read your, your chapter, Tabiso, and I, it just breaks my heart what you're going through because I, it makes me very aware that in fact, Rosemary was in a very privileged position. Um, and she has not had to go into hiding. She did wear a bulletproof vest, vest at one point because we all could see this is huge money involved here. A lot of people, very sensitive issues. You know, people are going to be out to get her. 
um, anyway, it never came to anything, but she has not had to leave home. So I don't want to compare her situation with yours because I think things are a lot tougher for you on multiple, multiple levels. Things went wrong where we would rather not know that they go very wrong and continue to. It's about power, abuse of power, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was defeated. I, I really appreciate the fact that you've made that distinction between uh, Rosemary's situation and Tavis's situation, because of course, you know, that there are different sacrifices being made for the country at, at very different levels. And, and I think that's very honorable for you to have pointed that out. But I still think it's admirable. At some stage, Rosemary was offered the, the option to, to leave the FSP, she was offered a six million rand payout. Uh, she clearly, despite all the difficulties she'd already suffered by that stage, decided not to take it because it seems to me that would have been too easy a way out for, for someone with that level of conscience. She also went all the way up to the Constitutional Court in demanding an, an investigation into the FSB's activities. She lost that case, but I get the sense that there were other wins, though, uh, as a result of her having spoken out. Can you just briefly tell, tell us what, in your mind, those might have been for well, certainly the, the biggest win, I think, is that um, she was able to put the story out there, you know, in the sense that, okay, yes, it was in some cases hidden in the financial pages of the, of the newspapers and media and so on. So not everybody had direct access to it. But ultimately, she has made many boards jump. So, that, you know, we've heard that on the grapevine, is that boards, I think, are often quite spoilt they believe the reports that they're given which of course they're layers and layers and layers of putting the best foot forward that ultimately arrives on the um, on the desk of a board um, and boards don't necessarily know that they must dig deeper they must probe they must question and so on and i think that boards are uh, need a lot of work if they are to to perform their duties um, properly um, of course, the, the risk is maybe they'll cover up better. Also, very importantly, is that there is a ground swell of pensioners um, who have been unpaid. They know that they've got their money somewhere and they don't have access to it. And some of them have had their names taken off the, those pension funds because the pension funds are, are making good money for, um, for corporates, basically. And now they are beginning to collect, they are beginning to find ways to search for their money, they are, there is a support um, at a civic level, at the ground roots level, um, so that even people who are as relatively weak as pensioners are, when I say weak, I mean unorganized, vulnerable and so on, they are starting to be able to hold people to account, hold the, the, the people who are supposed to be protecting their finances, their futures, the futures of their grandchildren and so on, to account. A lot of effort needs to go into raising the voice, raising, supporting people on the ground who are in this very, very vulnerable position. And I hope closing the gap between what is in on paper, in other words, the processes and the laws, with what is in practice. There's a huge gap there. I mean, Catherine, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for sharing Rosemary's story with us and, and the difference that her um, you know, what, what appears to be a loss, but, but uh, you know, under, under the guise of that, has actually had quite a number of wins, particularly for a, a vulnerable group as, as pensioners. I want to bring John back into the conversation at this mm. point. John, we know you as an activist in your own right, mm. but uh, uh, just to recap, your chapter in Mandy's book is about an international whistleblower you supported in his journey to unearthing irregularities around the ETOS, which we know has been a hugely mm. controversial issue in our country, particularly in our province. The man's only identified as Captain Kirk. What was he actually alleging when he contacted the organization on doing tax abuse, better known as ALTA, which you were involved in? Um, well, I need to paint a bit of a backstory to this, and I want to really, as a preface to what I share, uh, just honor what Tabiso and others have done in terms of the reality of dealing in a rural context, of the erosion of a rule of law. And my activism has really been, for the last 20 years, working with the Amadiba rural community on the wild coast. The commonality between the Amadiba and the Gauteng Motorist was, uh, was, was Sanrail, South African National Roads Agency. And when I happened to meet Wayne Dubonnet in 2009, I thought it was only rural communities that weren't consulted properly by government. He was at that stage still with Avis, working with the Kaha industry. 
and how he said they'd basically been ignored as well. So we found this sort of strategic alliance between his, the interests of urban motorists, relatively privileged and relatively disadvantaged community of the Wild Coast, who are fighting this Australian mining company and the Department of Resources to determine their own destinies locally. So with that context, Wayne then brought me in to assist him with helping him to process the massive outpouring of concern from the public at large. And being a social worker, you know, very much one of our cardinal principles is that you need to ensure protagonism of the people, that people become, you know, the protagonists of their own narrative and their story. And, uh, and I wanted to ensure that what Arta really became in his early days was a, a conduit for stories to emerge. Nazar Ali was not prepared to really be as transparent as he needed to be. We smell a rat, but how do we get confirmatory evidence? You know, in journalism, you need to have corroborating evidence. In social work, we try and look at triangulating evidence, not just two confirming sources, but a third one, because with that triangulation process, you get more. And then one day, this email came in from a guy who called himself James Tiberius. And that's how it all began. So I really have, was there to be played this, a similar role that I be, had been playing with the Amadeba as being a conduit and finding my social work credentials and training and accountability, providing something of a safer space for people to share their stories that they weren't exposed as as we've seen in so many of the stories, to the point at which they get shot and killed. He was overseas, it wasn't a South African, so he, he wasn't as vulnerable there. And he was then able to actually confirm that the narrative that Sanral was basically portraying was very, shall we say, partial and left out some very key aspects. And that if we got to court, we would be able to win the case in, in showing that Etols was not a lawful because of a failure to fundamentally be accountable to section 195 of the constitution. John, thank you for that. So let's for a moment look at the legal framework around this. What is possible uh, based on, on what currently exists in the law? Um, and, and let me bring Colette in here. Colette, thank you for your patience. Uh, you, we haven't heard a word from you so far. But, but perhaps you can start telling us now, do we have an extensive set of laws governing and supporting whistleblowing in South Africa? The short answer is no. We can do a lot better in terms of creating a legal framework that minimizes the suffering of the human beings who become whistleblowers. South Africa is a decade behind the rest of the world in all our anti-corruption laws and policies. Transparency International um, wrote a report that pinpointed the South African Whistleblowing Act as being much too narrow in scope. So we have an outdated law. I can't wait to hear what my comrade Tabiso says about um, what he would like to see in the new version of that law, because we have to lobby for legal reform and institutional reform. The only question is, in this movement towards reforming our legislative framework, what examples do we draw from internationally? Now, I've had a look at the international legal framework around whistleblowing, and there are some interesting examples of laws in the United States that pay out huge amounts of money to whistleblowers so that they can protect themselves. There is an interesting example of, a, of a, the best law supposedly in the world is the European Union Directive, which was only promulgated last year. So it's very current, but I read this law and I, I see, and I think our whistleblowers would see a lot of holes in this law. It doesn't provide adequate protection for whistleblowers, particularly in the South African context. We could not just import that law into South Africa and expect it to address the unique challenges that we face in this country. And I'm speaking about the high rate of assassination 
a whistleblowers. There's a, an, in, an international NGO called the Global Initiative Against Organized Crime. It's an international NGO that wrote a report on South Africa's extremely high rate of contract killings for economic gain, covering many deaths, including those of whistleblowers. So whatever legal reforms we, we come up with, we have to take into account South Africa's unique context. And it would be great to hear what Tabiso has to say about what he would like to see in a new law. Because something I'd like to bring to the attention of civil society right now is that we might, according to international experts, have a, a window of opportunity in South Africa to make real meaningful reforms in respect of many different anti-corruption areas, but particularly whistleblowing. They are of the opinion that South Africa is at a moment, a rare unique opportunity right now where we can reverse corruption and get back on the path to improved governance. And we are watching certain areas in um, the South African political landscape for signs of real change, not just political speeches about anti-corruption, but real meaningful change. And we are seeing genuine positive signs. But one area that it that is still gravely lacking is um, in real meaningful protection for whistleblowers. When we see genuine protection for whistleblowers in this country, then we will be well on the way to ticking all the boxes of heading back towards a state under a better governance system. But I just want to ask as well, from a, the, the, the point of view of organizations like government or private companies or even NGOs for, for that matter, do, do we have internal mechanisms at all to, uh, to allow for, for these organizations to safeguard whistleblowing? Is that, and is that something that could be produced independently of national? You know, we have the Protective Disclosures Act, which um, supposedly provides some protection to employees in the corporate environment. The Companies Act has a section which goes a bit further and provides um, some further protection to other people, not just strictly employees, but also suppliers and other people connected with the business. The National Environmental Management Act also has a clause about whistleblowing. But there are so many gaps in practice and human beings are falling through those gaps. And the consequences for the human beings is devastating. But more than that, there's a professor of law at New York University who recently wrote a book in which she says that the number one most effective way to detect financial crime is to provide support for whistleblowers. I just want to pause for a moment there. She didn't say the most effective way is to see people in orange overalls or to increase the budget of law enforcement agencies. No, it's much simpler than that and much more cost effective. If we protect whistleblowers, we take the burden of investigating financial crime off a severely under-resourced law enforcement agencies. And that is a problem faced by every country throughout the world. And the reason for this is because financial crime is a unique kind of crime where you don't have a victim who's willing to speak out and to give evidence. You have two parties to the crime who are trying to keep a secret. But research shows that those two parties, as well as trying to keep a secret, face many temptations to betray one another. And so policymakers and lawmakers need to make it easy and safe for one of those people in the corrupt relationship to come forward with information. It is absolutely vital. Experts are of the opinion that it is the single most important thing that we can do to fight corruption. 
it really is uh, it really is good to hear from a, a legal mind as to exactly what sort of framework exists or what framework is in the pipeline uh, in terms of the amendments as well. And Tabi, so uh, let's move into a more generalized section here where, where I'm, I'm just going to, to have a conversation with, with the entire panel. And, and I'm going to start with you, Tabi, so simply because Colette has, uh, has, has suggested something quite important here. What do you think in the amendments of this law needs to be considered first and foremost? A few, few things that uh, one may, may have to throw in. Uh, among those things is that uh, the current legislation or the current uh, the, the laws seems to protect people that are in a working environment. Even there, we have seen quite a lot of cases where uh, there, there will be disputes on the channels that one has used uh, the, in, in whistleblowing and all. But in an open environment for a citizen who sees wrong being done or being alerted that there is a wrong that is being done elsewhere, and that person takes an initiative to bring that into the attention of the authorities, either at a certain company or uh, to the authorities in as far as law enforcement agencies and, and, other, and other, other fora that are there. And you find a situation, let me take uh, my own case. You, you, I, I was the blue for quite a long time uh, on different uh, things and uh, there were convictions, there were arrests. Then when it came to this matter that uh, seemed to, to want to, to take my life away, especially the matter where, which resulted in the death of the dates in the summer you, 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 when, when you say, I need protection, there is no one who wants to protect you because you'll be told that uh, you are not a witness in any uh, court of law, right? Uh, when, when you say, no, but I'm a citizen of this country, uh, the constitution stipulates that the citizens of this country must be protected, that they must be protected by, by SAPS. SAPS will say, no, no, we are not, you are not our issue. We are the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice will say you are not a, a, a witness in any matter. So you are in between. You, you don't know where to go, right? Uh, up until a situation presents itself, like in my case, a situation only presented itself when I was shot, right? If I had not been shot, the being a, a, a witness in my own matter, it means that uh, no one would have taken care of my of my of my own situation. Even after I had been shot, no one wanted to take care of my own situation. So I think there is a, there is a, a, a line somewhere which needs to be uh, uh, scratched a little bit, which needs to come clearer on how how are the citizens of this country who decides on their own free will to say, I want to, to alert the authorities that there is something that is wrong that is going on there. Once that has happened, you are not doing it because you want to be protected. But if your whistleblowing through that puts you in a position where your life is threatened, there must be a space in, in the laws of this country that uh, you, 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 you will find protection for doing that. You, you don't you don't say provide me with the, the BMW bodyguards and other things, but let there be a space, let there be an environment that allows you to continue doing what you are doing. If you take a whistleblower or an anti-corruption activist or an anti-corruption defender and you take him to a witness protection, it means we are, we are removing in the society a very important voice, someone who's willing to take the risk that are out there, but you're taking that person and you put that person in a certain prison because these witness pr the, the protection programs are not different. They're, they're from, you take away your phone, you can't contact your own family, you can't contact your kids you, you, and, and anyone, right? So I don't think that uh, that is how people are supposed to be treated for doing the right thing. You take away a person who's doing the right thing to put him away, you leave the thugs, you don't arrest the, 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 the political gangsters and other people that are doing wrong things. And Mandy, something that amazes me, and this is something that Athol Williams has spoken about in regard to his disclosure about the, the allegations in, in regard to Bain and Company, is how much time whistleblowers are spending, uh, you know, compiling the documents, compiling the affidavits, spending away from work, testifying before commissions and the like, if, if, if that is, the, is what is required in a particular case. And there is no compensation for them whatsoever. Uh, there's been a suggestion by Professor Tulima Dunsella recently that, that whistleblowers should be paid for the important work they're doing in the country. How do you feel about that after sifting through all of this information? 
Very much so, and I completely agree with with Ethel. In fact, you know, I, I have some regret about not including his story in the book as well because he speaks so so powerfully about that. Um, and I agree with him. You know, it becomes all encompassing. It really becomes a full time uh, vocation in a way that um, the whistleblowers spend so much time putting together documents and drawing up affidavits, uh, and it really, really is time consuming. Um, and and they're not compensated for that. And then you couple that with the fact that you have these big core corporates or state-owned entities that will drag litigation through the courts for years and years and years and just bleed whistleblowers dry, which is why it's so important to have organizations that support whistleblowers uh, legally but financially as well. So, so in South Africa, we've got PLUF, we've got outer um, corruption watch, not to the same extent with whistleblowers, uh, the Ahmed Katrada Foundation. Um, but I think we, I, I've always suggested um, that perhaps we should look at legislation like we see in the Netherlands, which supports something like a, a chapter nine organization, which is a whistleblower house. So then we would see uh, an independent organization that is funded by government, but is run by civil society. And that would give financial, emotional, physical, um, and, and legal support to whistleblowers. So, I, I mean, I do think we need to find a, a different way, an innovative way to support whistleblowers, to encourage them to come forward. Catherine, may I bring you in here? Because Rosemary Johnson has made an interesting suggestion. She, she's proposed, uh, similarly to what Mandy has spoken about, the establishment of an independent NGO dedicated to whistleblowing. But she says it should be set up and funded by financial companies. And, and it occurs to me that maybe this is workable, given that, that companies don't want to be plying uh, money into processes that take longer than they should. Um, so, so perhaps that, that's an efficient way of doing it. Uh, in, in your mind, is that something that could work? Um, yes, but I need to say up front that I don't think I'm in a, in a position to say more than you've said. Um, I, I totally agree that there, there needs to be a place that people can go to. Um, for support on all the levels that Mandy has just listed. As Tabitha says, the common person is supposed to be protected. You know, we're, this country is supposed to be providing security for people, general. It's, it should not be to do with financial or with, and so on and so on and so on. The answer lies in the fact that civil, civil run organization, maybe a chapter nine institution, has to actually be a place where people can go to for all the possible support that they need. And of course, um, yes, you will get some chances, you will get some people who have nefarious uh, motives, but they have their internal checking system. And that should never ever be a reason why um, people should who are in a position where they've got something to say that they don't feel they can say in their in their work environments. Have, have a place to go where they are safe and they are looked after and they are supported and ultimately they are, you know, recognized for the important, the hugely important contribution that they make to the, the growth of our, of our young democracy, you know. But Catherine, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And it actually leads me to my next point. John, you, you are probably best placed to answer this as a social worker. Uh, but also one who's dealt specifically with, with whistleblowers and, and who's acted against large corporations on his own in, in uh, contexts where they can be particularly hostile. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a huge emotional element to this, mm. where, where the distress and the trauma caused from being a whistleblower mm. leads to alienation, to isolation, mm. to destroyed family relationships, to uh, careers mm. that, that, are, that go under. Uh, what sort of emotional support uh, is needed for, for a, a person who is going through this whistleblowing process, perhaps needs some kind of psychological mm. counseling and, and support in getting through what is a very traumatic process. It is. And in fact, one of my good friends who's a psychologist uh, who has done trauma counseling for people with PTSD and that, he believes that it should be mandatory for whistleblowers to go and have trauma counseling. And he's offered himself as a service to support them. And I've had a chat with Cynthia Stimple and I have now become friends. I'm just so admiring of her in terms of what she's doing. Her, she and I were just reflecting exactly about how important it is and how she personally found herself going so far out on a limb, even within her church. So there's need for support for whistleblowers from professionals across the board. I mean, when I signed up to be a social worker, I knew I wasn't going to 
to make lots of money. Fortunately, I married a good wife who regards me as her personal social responsibility project and enables me to do what I do. But I'm just one person. And I know that within the social work profession, there are lots of skills and abilities and willingness to contribute, but then they, they, they're often private practice, not in state practice, so they need to be funded. They can't afford to do it pro bono. Mandy quotes me in her book about quoting uh, Kierkegaard, where he says, you know, life has to be lived forwards, but it can only be understood backwards. And thank you, Mandy, because your book, as I've read it and reread it and that I worked with you on that one chapter, the penny has suddenly dropped for me that, that there are a lot of people out there who are living their lives forward. And there needs to be this process of curating of all that experience so that we have this, this solid body of experience and knowledge that can basically make sure that history gets back on track in this country in terms of what our constitutional values are. Last point just to make, and social workers are very reluctant to be, become the story. We try and stay in the background. But what then happened, and the reason I basically left out and got more involved again in the Kolobeni story, was when uh, Bazooka Khadebe was shot and killed and assassinated in 2016. To this day, I still have other clients in the community who are essentially whistleblowers, and I'm still in this invidious position of being, having the privileges of being white, the privileges of living in Johannesburg and having a very good network of friends and connections in the media and in law, at least I can play that game role of trying to at least provide some sort of avenue for information. And I share that because um, what then happened to me in 2016 is that I got served with this defamation slap suit. What really irks me is that it's simply because of whistleblowers who have been sharing their stories with me that they want to get access to. It's not just me. There's six of us, three lawyers and a social worker who have now been targeted by this mining company. So there's about saying, how do we can get some legislation in place that actually outlaws the abuse of legal process so that explains a little bit about my agenda in hosting this webinar and inviting you all because I want to make sure that this is up on YouTube, that people know that you're going to win this. We have social media on our side. We can roll back that mudslide. We can begin to sort of uh, ensure that that information does find its way through. And hopefully we will start seeing a more coherent and strategic process within civil society at large to make sure that we actually get this thing going. Because I don't see myself as the one speaking truth to power and sort of on the, on the barricades. I see myself as simply wanting to continue to play that supportive role at the psychosocial level. And it just really hurts me to think that I've now been hampered from doing that because I've now got the slap suit to deal with. Fortunately, Eva Wenzels is supporting us pro bono and we're trying to make lemonade out of that bitter lemon as social workers must always try and do but you know i sometimes i feel that the lemonade goes a bit sour too and it becomes a bit vinegarish so i'm really concerned to see how we can get civil society and the a groundswell of people to say hang on this this has to stop john thank you for that and thank you so much for the contribution that you're making with this kind of work that you I want to try and get a range of opinions on the suggestion also by Tulema Madonsela that we should perhaps be thinking about an amnesty in this country for people who've been involved in corruption and the like, uh, so that it, it will draw out more perpetrators, essentially. Uh, and, and there's part of me that thinks, well, that it'll be great to have truth around this, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean justice will be done. And uh, um, Tavisa, I'm going to ask you to start with your, your opinion on this. Why don't you share with me how, would you, how you would feel about an amnesty, particular, particularly in your context, for the people who've targeted you up to now? I've got very strong views around this, but I, I'm going to try and to, to be a little bit um, diplomatic on how I will put them across. I, I don't think that she thought this properly. Um, people are losing lives because of uh, this corruption, right? People have lost life. Are you expecting that those people who committed corruption and at a later stage just to cover it up had to kill people are going to come out and say, I did this, and when other people were trying to expose it, and this is what I did? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. 
the other thing that is important is that uh, the, the, the corrupt people must not have it so easy, right? They, they have stolen the future of our children. This country is going to take quite a lot of years uh, to get better, uh, to, to be where it was supposed to be. But lastly, some of us are, are working with bullets in our bodies because of fighting this corruption. Some of us continue to be violated on daily basis in our own spaces, in our own homes by the, the state operatives, the police, right? Who come and um, search our homes without uh, search warrants, who come and arrest us and put us in detention without uh, arrest warrants. They, and when that happens, the, the Professor Matonzela and others, even if our own plight is uh, publicized um, else, uh, everywhere in the media, I haven't heard her saying anything about us who are being victimized as whistleblowers. I haven't heard her saying uh, she wants to offer her services as a, a legal person to come and get me out when I'm arrested at Mountain Rice for speaking truth to power. And at the end, I end up having to fork a lot of money getting private lawyers who I'm supposed to pay so that I will be released. And at a later stage, there is no case at the all. At the end, I get told that it was a... <clears throat> I was not supposed to be arrested in the first place. So I don't think that she thought it properly. I, th I think that she, she spoke in the comfort of her own office. That's a, that's a very heartfelt opinion, given what you, you have experienced in the last few years, Tabiso, and I thank you for that. Uh, Mandy, you've got an overview, uh, having spoken to all these whistleblowers and, and having got a real sense of, of, of their personal suffering um, on, on a most human level. What's your feeling about that? Do you think that wrongdoers deserve an amnesty, or whether there ought to be some sort of other justice for whistleblowers? No, I definitely am not in favour of, of an amnesty. And I've written about this, saying that for me, it feels as though it would be giving up, as if we would be saying we have no faith in the National Prosecuting Authority or in the Hawks. And when you consider how much people have sacrificed of their own lives to ensure that this corruption comes to light, if you look at how much money has already been paid back into the fiscus as a result of whistleblowers, exposing state capture, then, you know, it's something that we just cannot allow to happen. It, 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 just, it just can't happen. We can't have a, an amnesty for, um, for corruption. Um, and I think that what we really need to do is see more whistleblowers, encourage more whistleblowers to come forward if we're going to fight corruption. And that means that we have to stack the cards in their favor. We have to entice whistleblowers. And if you're a potential whistleblower and you're looking at the stories of the people who are profile in the book and you, you're thinking about coming forward, you're unlikely to do so if you look at the results for many of them personally. And that has to change. We have to have a societal revolution in how we treat whistleblowers in South Africa uh, in terms of, of legislation, but also in terms of how we treat them, how we think about them. They deserve to be applauded. They deserve to, to be given national orders. We should be appointing them to the boards of companies as ethics officers. A lot has to change. Uh, Colette, would an amnesty even be possible uh, under the law? Joanne, in the past 10 years, there are six countries that have given amnesties for corruption. Those countries are Romania, Nigeria, Moldova, Mongolia, Tunisia, and the Philippines. None of those countries are what one would call bastions of good governance and anti-corruption. Do we really want to follow their example? At the same time, I, do, I have listened very carefully to what Tuli Madwonsela has been saying. And what I hear from her is not so much um, that she's attached to the concept of amnesty, but rather that she is saying, if, if you look underneath the conceptual language that she's using, she is saying there need to be incentives for people to voluntarily come forward and self-disclose information about corruption. There, I completely agree with her. I just want to caution that this, whatever solution South Africa finds needs to be grounded in our constitution and in international law because corruption is an international crime and we need to follow international best practice of which there are plenty of examples, none of which are evident in the six countries which I mentioned earlier. Thank you so much for that. And, and Tabiso, I think I'm going to close with you because 
uh, you, you're the one member of our panel this afternoon who has a very, very personal uh, experience of whistleblowing here uh, in, in, a, in an extremely dangerous situation where your life has been under threat. There, there will be people watching this webinar and, and they, would, they might be saying to themselves, well, I'm now, uh, I'm now at the point where I, I have some very sensitive information. I do want to reveal it. And my conscience tells me that I ought to go public. What, what, what advice would you give them? What would you say to people who are on the verge of doing that? What do they need to keep in mind, Tabiso? Look, what one needs to be motivated by, one must not be motivated by revenge, one must not be motivated by factional uh, uh, fights or politics. One must be motivated by making sure that uh, whatever the person has seen, it's something that needs to be corrected and it must be corrected for the benefit of our people and for the benefit of this country. But the other important thing is that uh, they must know that uh, they, they, there are a lot of uh, pain, there are a lot of sleepless, sleepless nights in, in, in this. But having said that, it's a worthy cause that one must be involved in because if they don't do it, no one is going to do it. They must do it so as to be exemplary to others so that others will emulate and follow their, 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 what they've done. So it's quite important that once, once they start doing that, they must keep all the records in proper places. They must interact with relevant people. They must be careful on who they give the information to. They must not talk to as many to, to many people. They must talk to those who who are going to process says that thing. They must alert their family members of what information they have, and they must start preparing that if things go wrong, how are they going to survive? Tabiso, thank you so much for that. There, there is so much to bear in mind before one takes that huge step to becoming a whistleblower. So I thank you all for sharing your different experiences with us. Mandy Wiener bringing us the perspective of the author who pulled all of this together. Tabiso Zulu, a man whose life has been direly affected by, by what has happened in regard to his own whistleblowing experience. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for sharing Rosemary Hunter, your sister's experience with us. Uh, Colette Ashton, I want to thank you as well for bringing the legal angle to give us some idea of what is possible within that framework. And John Clark, of course, the gentleman who's put this all together uh, in his uh, very many guises of being a social worker, being a whistleblower himself, and, and, and really being on the forefront of also uh, in enabling and facilitating whistleblowing. Thank you, John, for the huge role that you are playing mm -hmm. here. And of course, uh, the conversation continues on John's platform uh, because he is going to, uh, to, to explore this, this area in, in, a, in further discussions. I know, John, that uh, you know it is such a vast area, and, and that you are hoping to explore this area further with uh, with Catherine Gunn. Uh, uh, she has been involved in, in the making of Gavin Hood's film, uh, Official Secrets, something really to look forward to in terms of of understanding the mechanisms of whistleblowing and what has happened to, to other people who've done this. And then, of course, Andrew Feinstein, who is a familiar face and name to so many of us, the former ANC Member of Parliament, who disclosed some important information about the arms deal and blew that open. So John will continue with that on this platform. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. And John, thank you so much for having me. Well, to wrap things up, I, the title that I have adopted for this installment, Springing the trap is a bit obscure and ambiguous and so let me explain what was in my mind about it. The phrase springing the trap contains two metaphors. Firstly the metaphor of a trap and that's because many years ago one of my mentors, the pioneering systems thinker Stafford Beer, shared a quote with me that has hugely helped me in my own efforts to speak truth to power and in doing so to escape the traps that the powerful try to use to snare and disable critics. It's a quote from a book titled Freedom in a Rocking Boat, written in the 70s by somebody, Sir Geoffrey Vickers, and this is what he says. The nature of the trap is a function of the nature of the trapped. To describe either is to imply the other. We, the trapped, tend to take our state of mind for granted, which is partly why we are trapped. But with the shape of the trap in our minds, we shall be better able to see the relevance of our limitations and to question those assumptions about ourselves which are most inept to the activity and experience of being human now.
He illustrates it by means of a metaphor. He says, a man entering a man-sized lobster pot will become suspicious of the narrowing tunnel. He would shrink from the drop at the end, and if he fell in, he would recognize where the entrance was as a possible exit and climb out again, even if he were the shape of a lobster. So a trap is a trap only for creatures that cannot solve the problems that it sets. Man traps are dangerous only in relation to the limitations of what men can see and value and do. As this applies to the whistleblowers I've known, as they become more aware and conscious of wrongdoing in the world out there, in the organizations, they must simultaneously act on the inner world, their own sense of conscience. Now, this symbol that I keep using illustrates, it's composed of two lines of infinity, an inward and an outward. And as they dance with one another, it forms a beautiful three-dimensional symbol known as a triqueta. Now, I explained the whole thing in other videos, but the point now is simply, it seems to me, that effective whistleblowing requires one to keep moving on both journeys simultaneously and not to fall into the trap of either withdrawing into an isolation, beating yourselves up with guilt and thinking it's all your fault, on the one hand, or throwing yourself into the battle with a passionate activist mentality but without any introspection, on the other hand. Cynthia Stimple, the whistleblower who exposed the abuse of power by Dudu Mieni when she was chair of SAA, and was instrumental, in fact, in getting Dudu Mieni declared a Lincoln director, perfectly illustrates that journey as I have got to know her. Her story doesn't actually feature in Mandy's book because she's writing her own book, in which she tells me is now finished and is with the editors, so that's another instalment to look forward to. But as Cynthia shared a bit about her own story, I, I got the sense that she never let fear get the better of her because she had simultaneously developed her own moral conscience in the process of spiritual contemplation and developed a consciousness about what was really going on. So it was conscience and consciousness dancing with each other, the internal and the external. Now, people who allow themselves to be intoxicated by power don't do that. And they are ultimately the ones who really get stuck in the trap because they tend to prioritize greed and ambition for power and it eventually catches up with them. But they will, of course, project their guilt and try to scapegoat others. And Mandy's book is full of stories of where this has happened. And we are, we're both concerned that when she published a book, it might have the opposite effect of what she intended because some of those stories are really so... You know, disconcerting that they might have a chilling effect on other potential whistleblowers. Which brings me to the second metaphor in the title, Springing the Trap. And as I, just to tell you a quick story, in my first job as a social worker in the early 80s, I worked for World Vision, a humanitarian aid organization in Kozini, Natal, and there was a serious drought taking its toll, particularly in rural communities. There was no rain falling. But there was water below the surface, and people on the ground with know-how and commitment, and together with the Valley Trust and other rural development NGOs, we perfected the technique of spring protection, and it involved finding the eye of the spring and building a concrete V-box to protect it and fencing it around so that it didn't get contaminated with E. coli from the water was then piped to one or more ferro-cement tanks constructed downstream for surrounding homesteads to use for washing, cooking and drinking without risking disease. It occurs to me that that natural spring protection is a perfect metaphor to help understand and create shared meaning for what whistleblowers do and need to do. Because there is a vast subterranean aquifer of damning information waiting to be brought to the surface. So we need to lobby hard from all angles to make sure that whistleblowers are protected. And as Colette Ashton said, protecting whistleblowers is ultimately the most effective and least expensive way of dealing with corruption. So think about that as a root metaphor and ask yourself, anybody watching this, to what extent are you responsible for needing to bring stuff to the surface? 
to what extent are you a potential spring that can help cleanse our society from like, the contagion of corruption. So, thank you. Where to from here? Well, Cynthia has formed a support group for whistleblowers, appropriately titled Citizens of Conscience Foundation. And I plan to interview her in one of my future installments so she can tell you more about that. But in the meantime, don't wait. Uh, I've just learned about the website launched by Parry with the toolkit. So he has the link to the website. And if you want to be kept up to date with what's happening in this whistleblower process, please subscribe to my channel. Lastly, just to explain the music and the musician. He is Tando and Kozi. And I came across him walking down the road in Boiki when I was on the Wild Coast a few weeks ago filming. And I promised him I'd try and help him get going in his music career. So if anybody thinks they can, I have his contact number.